The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good morning to our attendees on the West Coast. Welcome to today's webinar on the topic of reducing carbon emissions and operating costs with air-to-water heat pumps. My name is Doug Picklick. I'm the editor of HPAC Magazine, Canada's leading business publication for mechanical contractors and their supply partners. Today's webinar is being presented by Klima Venita, a subsidiary of Mitsubishi Electric, and this session will run about 60 minutes, including time for any questions and answers at the end. So please, as you're listening today, enter any questions you have into the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel on your screen. And we will try to get to them all and still wrap up on time. Before we begin, I'm proud to introduce our speaker. Chris DeRoche is the Applied Product Manager for the HVAC division with Mitsubishi Electric Sales Canada. Chris is a professional engineer and a graduate of mechanical engineering from Dalhousie University. He has extensive experience in all aspects of the HVAC manufacturing industry, including product design, certification and testing, sales and service, and with a specific history in air to water heat pump solutions for the commercial and residential sectors. So uh, we're about ready to start. So again, it's my pleasure to introduce Chris DeRoche. Chris, take it away. Hey, thanks, Doug. Uh, so again, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today to talk about air to water heat pumps, which is um, a hot topic these days and it's continuously evolving. So uh, we just wanted to put on a session, you know, just talking about the technology in very broad general terms, um, as we'll start to see this more and more over the next decade as we see the carbon tax influencing how we make our uh, HVAC system choices in the Canadian market. Uh, so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about air to water heat pumps. We'll go over a technology overview, explain how that works. Um, then we'll kind of address some potential misconceptions about the technology by looking at the Canadian climate in a bit more detail. Uh, falling into that, we'll talk about uh, central air to water heat pump plants and sizing and design considerations. Uh, then we'll also get into operating cost comparison. How do we compare natural gas to electric heat pumps uh, from an efficiency? And both a cost point of view. Uh, and then, of course, throughout the presentation, we'll have examples um, of different types of systems, both residential and commercial, followed by questions and answers towards the end. Uh, so, again, for learning objectives for today, um, we're just looking, you know, I, I hope everyone leaves this session understanding generally um, the conventional air to water heat pump technologies, how they work, how they can be implemented into your next designs. And also understand the limitations with air to water heat pumps and basically to factor that in uh, to your design process to overcome implementation challenges and realize the benefits that air to water heat pumps can provide. Um, also, I, I want to make sure that everyone understands how to compare uh, operating costs for conventional gas boilers to air to water heat pumps to help with the decision making process. And really, at the end of the day, I hope the main takeaway from everyone will be to see the potential of using this technology as an alternative to traditional gas-fired boilers in low-carbon applications, because that's really where air-to-water heat pumps shine. So uh, let's talk about the operating principle. So everyone is likely familiar with at least um, a standard air-cooled chiller. Uh, so an air-cooled chiller, we have a condenser on that machine that is basically rejecting heat. We're running a compressor within the machine in order to produce chilled water for a building. Air to water heat pump basically just works, um, you know, it's referred to sometimes as a reversible chiller, air to water heat pump. There's a lot of uh, misnomers for it, but basically with the reversing valve in the refrigeration circuit, we basically flip our heat exchangers for the unit. So in cooling mode for standard chiller, we'd have a condenser that's used to reject heat by using a compressor to move heat from one location to another. So in heating mode, um, this is the refrigeration cycle just showing heating mode. Basically through the reversing valve, we're redirecting refrigerant flow so that that condenser that was on the machine is now acting as an evaporator. And from a refrigerant point of view, this means that we're using this to extract heat from the environment. 
So basically in order to extract heat from a cold ambient condition, we need to send refrigerant to that heat exchanger that's colder than the ambient conditions in order to be able to move heat from one location to another. And the main objective is to produce hot water to use in your building. And now you can look at using the air to water heat pump in heating mode as an alternative to traditional um, gas fired boilers. So it sounds great in principle. Um, you know, if there's a device that exists that can produce cooling as a chiller or hot water when it's operated in heat pump mode, why don't we use these systems already today? It is a bit of a, a niche market right now, but it is an emerging technology. Um, it's starting to be implemented more widely throughout Canada, which we'll talk about throughout the presentation. But from a general point of view, if we think of a commercial system, this also applies to residential. If we have a central chiller and boiler plant, usually in a two pipe changeover system, we'd have an air cooled chiller as part of that system that we'd operate in cooling mode during the summertime. And in the wintertime, we'll shut off that chiller and we'll operate off a boiler throughout the winter time to produce hot water to use in our building. So again, for a two pipe changeover system, it's important to recognize that with two pipes, that means you can only supply hot water to all the indoor equipment or chilled water to all the indoor equipment. So it's based off a seasonal changeover. So if we look here at the bottom with an air to water heat pump, the idea is we have a device that can provide cooling in the summer, same as our chiller. And in the winter time, now we can flip this over into heating mode and produce hot water. Um, and we still have an auxiliary boiler when we need to. The conventional um, perhaps misconception for air to water heat pumps is that um, they can't perform very well at very cold temperatures, which is true in some cases, but that's why we're putting on the webinar today to kind of talk about some of those challenges and how they can be addressed and how the product can be best applied. Um, so generally, you know, I'll say it right now, we'll talk about this throughout the presentation, but for this class of heat pumps, whether it's from Mitsubishi or another manufacturer, generally you're going to find that the operating limit is about minus 15, maybe minus 20 in some cases. So usually whenever I tell people that, you know, you can only use this product down to minus 15 or minus 20, usually the first answer is, oh, well, sorry, our design temperature is a little bit colder than that. We can't use the heat pump. And that's because currently we, we tend to seek a one size fits all solution for our buildings. And I get a lot of pushback saying, well, now we need an auxiliary boiler. But when you consider the investment in a hydronic system, um, the cost for that entire system, especially whenever you consider using a heat pump technology within that, um, the cost of the boiler itself that you need becomes a small cost in that overall project. Um, so, you know, if we look in British Columbia, they have a favorable climate and, and British Columbia is a heat pump market for sure. And they have, you know, uh, warmer temperatures throughout the winter that kind of support that. If you look in the prairies, you know, Edmonton or Calgary, the design temperatures there are, you know, between minus 30 and minus 40. So it varies all over the place and it will be dictated by climate as well, but there's still ways that we can apply the product. And even then, if we look at the weather data um, that we'll take a look at in the next slides, even though these are the, the extreme temperatures that you'll experience maybe for a few hours of the year, what you will find is there's actually relatively fewer hours where you can't use the heat pump at all, but with proper design and application, you can still take advantage of the heat pump. Um, so we're gonna start off here with milder climates. So this is a three year average for uh, weather for Vancouver. So Vancouver has a milder temperature. Their design temperature is around minus seven or minus eight. Um, and we'll see that in BC because of the, um, depending on how you design the system, you can still, actually eliminate natural gas in the Vancouver market. Um, and we're seeing this on a lot of projects where um, you know, they're not even having natural gas come into the building. Their climate supports that. Uh, is that realistic for us to achieve in places like Ontario or Quebec? Probably not. But really when it comes to air to water heat pumps, the way we need to think about it is it's more about reducing fossil fuel consumption when it's practical and feasible to do so. Um, so if we look in Vancouver, if we look at the general heating season between minus 10 and plus 10 degrees Celsius, there's still 4,400 hours that, uh, which represents 50% of the hours throughout the year where we're spending in heating season where we can use a heat pump. Um, this is the data for Toronto. So similarly in Toronto, our design temperature is around minus 23, minus 24 degrees Celsius, and uh, that's our design temperature. But when you look at the actual data, you'll find that there's actually very few hours where it actually goes below minus 15 or minus 10 where you couldn't use um, a technology like this. So even if we look at temperatures where it's colder than minus 10, 
um, you know, the three-year average for Toronto is, you know, about 200 hours, which is a little bit over a week. Uh, but still in Toronto, between minus 10 and plus 10, we're talking about 4,600 hours. So it's more than 50% of the hours throughout the year that we can still get good performance from an air to water heat pump. Uh, so now we're looking at Calgary as well. So obviously we're seeing more extreme temperatures in the prairie region. So obviously that number for the three-year average where it's colder than minus 15, you know, 450 hours. So in terms of temperatures where you're spending, uh, you know, time below minus 10 degrees Celsius, you're talking about 800 hours. So that is about 10% of the time um, where you wouldn't need an auxiliary heat source. But it's really all about incorporating the heat pump into the design as best as you can to achieve your design objectives. And where are you going to use an air to water heat pump? Really the, the projects for this type of technology shines is when you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at your building. So um, one of the reasons why I presented those previous charts with these, you know, odd ranges of temperatures, you know, temperature below minus 15 degrees Celsius, between minus 15 and minus 10, that's so that we can visualize a conventional operating envelope for an air to water heat pump. Um, so, you know, with the line that Mitsubishi has, those products go down, can operate and supply water as high as 55 degrees. It sounds great, but whenever you actually look at the operating envelope for the machine, so on the y-axis here, we're showing leaving water temperature from the machine. And on the x-axis, we have outside air temperature, shown both in degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and basically, nominally, the units can produce 55 degrees Celsius or 131 degrees Fahrenheit. But really, it can only do that between 3 degrees and 10 degrees Celsius, which is part of the reason why I presented the data in this way. Below minus 3 degrees outside air temperature, it becomes more difficult to extract heat from the environment using refrigerant um, with that evaporator that we talked about. So as it gets colder outside, the capacity that the heat pump can deliver will decrease. So will the supply temperature that the machine can decrease. Um, there are, you know, from other manufacturers um, for this class of heat pumps, typically this is what you'll find about a minus 15 degree Celsius operating range. Uh, sometimes you can find some equipment that can do slightly higher. Uh, supply temperatures. Sometimes you'll find products also that have vapor injection. So these can sometimes have operating limits, you know, that can operate down to minus 20 degrees Celsius or so outside, which is great. But if we go back to the Toronto example where our design temperature is minus 23, it still doesn't check that box. So we still need some sort of auxiliary heat source to use with that. But really with air to water heat pumps, kind of one of the main takeaways for it is you know, design your hydronic system with the lowest supply temperature that you can work with. Uh, because whenever we look at doing designs for HVAC, typically we want to design for a fixed temperature, otherwise our controls get complicated. So this kind of throws a wrench in how we would design and size our systems from a conventional point of view. Um, but just to illustrate, you know, if you can work with a lower water temperature, so 50 degrees Celsius or 122 Fahrenheit, this means that you can use the air to water heat pump as a heat source for the building and achieve that 50 degrees at all times, as low as minus five and as high as about 23 degrees Celsius. If you can design for a slightly lower water temperature of about 45 degrees C or 113, and this is kind of a key number that I'll keep talking about throughout the presentation because uh, this value is a good balance between having a hot enough supply temperature that you can have useful heat transfer in your heat emitters in the building if you design them accordingly for lower water temperatures and still have a good operating range where you can uh, use the heat pump all the way down to minus 10 and as high as 30 degrees Celsius. Um, so, you know, this is still within the realm of possibility for uh, typical convection heat emitters. If we want to design with even lower water temperatures, you know, 35 degrees Celsius, which is kind of the maximum for this type of heat pump down at minus 15. This means that you can basically use it throughout the entire year with a lower supply temperature. Now, how are you gonna heat a building with 35 degrees Celsius water, uh, 95 Fahrenheit? Uh, condenser loop applications is one. Uh, so if you're running other heat pump equipments and you really want a low carbon central plant, uh, that's perhaps one way that you can use it. In for radiant heating loops as well, operate at lower temperatures. So again, it's more so about looking at how the heat pump can operate, what it can do, and designing your design around that if you want to go for a low carbon project. Um, what ends up happening a lot of the time is, you know, someone will do a building design with everything based off a chiller boiler and they'll use conventional hot water design temperatures. 
and then they come to us and they say, okay, we want to add in the heat pump now so that we can uh, reduce the carbon from our building. And whenever you're trying to fit the heat pump into a project that's already been designed, sometimes you can do it. Other times it's more challenging or requires redesign. And depending at the stage of the process that the engineering consultant's at, sometimes that's not always possible. So really also to get the best benefit with an air to water heat pump, what you want to do is understand how it operates, how it fits into your design and design around that as much as possible to take full advantage of the heat pump. So if we consider now full load heating operating limits, this is shown at full load, but nominally, you know, typically with this class of heat pumps, it'll have a 55 degree Celsius supply. So whenever you're looking at applying that into a building, you really want to consider the relationship and understand it about how the outside air temperature will influence the supply temperature from the machine in heating mode. And you also need to understand how the capacity uh, will reduce as outside air temperature decreases. We'll have some examples of that coming up. But again, just keep in mind, whenever you get a rating from a manufacturer and you tell them your design conditions, they're going to provide that to you, including the D rate of uh, low ambient conditions. So again, we need an auxiliary boiler if our design temperature is below the limits that we can operate a heat pump with. Um, so, you know, below minus 15, if you can design for a 35 degrees C water temperature, that's fine. Below minus 15 outside air temperature, you just operate off the gas boiler. And whenever you look at the weather data that we took a look at a couple slides ago, you can see that there's very few hours, depending on where the project is, that you need to operate off the heat source. Um, so it's more of a holistic approach these days to say, what, how can I get the maximum benefit from the heat pump? So in addition to this, you know, you need an auxiliary heat source. So you can have a gas boiler um, if you want to go for lower operating costs. Um, certainly, if you have a building that's not connected to a natural gas distribution, you can have a propane boiler. Um, or if your goal is to totally eliminate carbon from the building as much as possible, electric boiler is also an option. Whenever we think about, you know, hydronic heating systems, currently the go-to is just gas-fired boilers, which are great. Natural gas will always have its place in Canada. Um, but if we want to start decreasing the amount of natural gas that we're using, our only other choice is really is to use an electric resistive boiler or an electric heat pump. And a heat pump will always perform better uh, than an electric boiler. Uh, however, the boiler doesn't have the limitation of changing supply temperature according to outside air. But if we can check that off as part of our design, we can still take advantage of using some sort of heat pump technology to heat that water. Uh, so again, just showing on this graph also though, and, and one thing that I encourage everyone to keep in mind, um, so this is kind of having another axis here, just showing graphically what the building space heating load would be in terms of percentage from 100% at your design condition. Um, and typically as it gets warmer outside, you have less and less heat losses uh, from the building. So you have less of a heating load as it gets warmer outside, and then eventually you'll change over to cooling depending on the building type. But another way to kind of think about it as well is since you will need an auxiliary boiler in most cases anyway, um, you know, with boilers, we use outdoor reset as a control strategy because really the heating system, what it's trying to do is basically just match the heat loss of the building at any given time. So as our heat loss decreases as it gets warmer outside, this still provides an avenue to use the heat pump to provide heating to the building. And one way you can maybe consider implementing this into your designs would be, you know, at your design day conditions for heating, whatever temperature that you want to use, 60 degrees Celsius, 140 Fahrenheit, which is the typical supply temperature for a condensing gas boiler. You can operate at a higher temperature as it gets colder out. And with boilers, we do outdoor reset control. Um, so one way you can kind of look at it as well is for the heat emitters in the building, design them for your, 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 your worst case load, but then you know, look at the capacity where you wanna use the heat pump. And again, this is why I mentioned 45 degrees Celsius supply, because this is a good balance be, of being able to run it all the way down to minus 10, but still have a hot enough temperature to have good heat transfer at the heat emitters. So you might wanna do a capacity check on the heat emitters and see what heat load do you actually require at minus 10? And with the 45 degrees Celsius from a heat pump, does this meet that heating load that I need to meet. And if that's the case, then you can kind of consider it as a two-stage system where you're running off the heat pump as long as the heat pump can provide 45 degrees. And then whenever it gets colder than minus 10, you just operate off a boiler and you can increase the supply temperature as needed. So 
so that's really in a nutshell how to kind of summarize the limitations in terms of the operating envelope which i would say is one of the most fundamental concepts about air to water heat pumps um, so again whenever you're reaching out to any manufacturer you know take a look at this and understand how that heat pump is going to perform over a wide variety of outside air temperature conditions so in terms of capacity we've been talking about how the capacity will decrease as it gets colder outside um, so this is showing an example of 140 kilowatt nominal heat pump. So when any manufacturer provides you a nominal capacity based off AHRI standards, be sure to take a close look at what those conditions actually are. Uh, so for AHRI 550, which is the standard, uh, the performance standard for rating this type of equipment, um, the nominal condition that the heating values are based on are typically seven or eight degrees Celsius. So if in theory, if we wanted to use one or more heat pumps to meet our total capacity, say we want to use the heat pumps all the time down to minus 15. So in this case, we would have checked in our design, okay, well, I have a 35 or perhaps 40 degree supply down to minus 15. As long as I can work with that, that's how you size it. If you wanted to use 45 degrees, for an example, you would just make sure that the heat pumps have the required capacity at minus 10. So we can design it so our heat pump plant can supply hot water at all times down to minus 15. Um, and then also shown on this graph is the building heating load. So we know at our worst case design conditions, minus 15 degrees Celsius in this example, that's where we have 100% of our heating load. But typically as it gets warmer outside, our heating load will drop off. In reality, our heating load isn't a linear curve. It will spike up and down throughout the year. But this is the general trend of what heat loss we need to make up for from either a boiler or an air to water heat pump. Um, but also, we'll talk about the COP, the coefficient of performance for the heat pump shortly. Um, but you know, the efficiency will also decrease as it gets colder outside. So for this reason, the supply temperature and really depending on what your project involves and what your objectives are, oftentimes we can reduce the sizing of the heat pump by considering that we probably don't want to run it all the way down to minus 15 at all times anyway even minus 10, depending on the design. So, you know, whenever we go back to, to the, the first slide that I started off with saying, you know, our design temperature is minus 25 and your heat pump cuts out at minus 15, I don't want to say that it doesn't matter, but it's almost like a non-issue anyway, because if we're trying to implement heat pumps in the best way in a, in a low carbon environment, we need to think a little bit more holistically about how we're going to use different energy sources to achieve our goals. So in this example, if you consider a bivalence point, uh, which really just means you have two heat sources in the system, you can reduce the capacity that the heat pump can supply, um, decrease the sizing of the heat pump, save on costs as well, um, by considering a bivalence point where maybe at minus seven, minus eight, maybe because you don't have the same supply temperature that you need for your design, or maybe the efficiency, that's the break even point that you've calculated. Oftentimes, we'll just switch over to an auxiliary boiler anyway. Um, so that's, again, one way to just think about the capacity of the heat pump and how you can best implement it into your building. So if we look up here in this chart here, this is just showing heating capacity uh, generally, according to outside air temperature on the left axis. Um, and in the black line here on the right axis, this is showing the COP. So you'll see the COP curve basically follows the same trend of heating capacity, but, you know, we have our highest coefficient of performance, so best efficiency, the warmer it is outside. Of course, that's because it's easy to extract heat from the ambient conditions using our 410A whenever it's very warm outside. And as it gets colder, this is where it's harder and harder to extract heat from the environment. It can still be done, but this results in a derated capacity and also the supply temperature that we talked about before. So we've kind of talked about you know, how the supply temperature is affected by outside air temperature, and we've talked about uh, coefficient of performance reduction according to outside air temperature. So the other things that are important to keep in mind about air to water heat pumps, and some of you might already be familiar with this, is that any kind of heat pump, um, because you have that evaporator outside, is you'll have frost and ice buildup. And the reason this occurs is because that coil on the outdoor unit is being used as an evaporator. And this means that if it's same as drinking um, a can of Coke and you put it on your desk on a humid day, you're going to have water droplets develop on that can from con condensation. Same thing happens with heat pumps where you basically need to manage that and prevent it. So on the next slide, we'll talk about how that works. But if the defrost doesn't work as it should, 
it quite literally snowballs and it can lead to basically an ice buildup until someone's getting a service call. So in air to water heat pumps, um, so this is showing the operation in heating mode. So basically we have a condenser or a heat exchanger at the building that is refrigerant to water and we're using this water in our building and it's extracting heat by using the compressor and using the coils on the machine as an evaporator. So basically, as it gets colder outside, if it's moist, you'll, you'll have ice or frost forming on that coil uh, because it's colder than the ambient conditions. So water droplets and moisture in the air are able to condense on that. So in air to water heat pumps, the way that we manage that is we actually, even though it's winter time, we actually turn the unit into cooling mode. So what we're doing is we basically turn our unit into cooling mode. So we send hot refrigerant gas to the condenser. We shut off the fans on top of the condenser so that we have a very, very hot temperature in those coils so that we melt off any frost or ice that's on the coils. At the same time on the indoor side, we shut off the pumps going to that heat exchanger because technically we're operating it in cooling mode now. Um, and if we left the pumps on, we would actually be cooling down the water in the buffer tank in the building, which is counterintuitive to what we're supposed to do. So this is something that internal logic within the heat pumps will automatically control. Um, most manufacturers have kind of two different flavors of this available. Some of them have standard defrost, which is really just based off the refrigerant evaporating pressure. And we use that as an indicator to tell us if we have frost or ice that's building up on the coil and inhibiting heat transfer. Um, another way is most manufacturers now um, with advances in technology and, and, and controls is that we're able to um, sometimes have auto adaptive defrost which basically um, involves looking at more parameters and also looking at the outside conditions on that particular day. So there's been great advancements in the technology generally to improve the overall operation and you know there is a bit of a misconception and if the product's not installed or designed properly or accounted for in some cases it can still happen and, and, and we hear stories of engineers experiences that they've had with a wide variety of manufacturers um so you know that's obviously a concern for engineers but there there are advances in the technologies and in the controls so that the defrost is basically optimized and really only defrosting for the true amount that's required these days so that's again just something to keep in mind as well and in particular whenever you're placing the heat pumps you know if they're going on a roof make sure that you have roof drains um, and the units located close to them potentially with backup uh, electric heaters at the drains to prevent freezing um, but you know or depending on where the machine's located it will have defrost cycles and it will melt all the ice off the coil um, and that just goes on the ground below it um, and obviously if it's winter time it's going to refreeze at some point as well so obviously disposing of that condensate best practice would be to pipe it to a drain but that's just something to keep in mind um, so in terms of you know that was technology um, operating envelope how to apply the product um, so now let's answer the question why would you want to use this you know, most of the time when I talk about air to water heat pumps, the first comment I usually get is that natural gas is very cheap in Canada, which is an accurate statement. However, costs are on the rise. Um, you know, Canada's introduced a carbon tax um, originally under the 2019 uh, Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, which set a price on carbon of 20 bucks per ton of uh, CO2 emissions. And that carbon plan was going to increase by $10 per year until it eventually hit $50 per year in 2022. Um, so in April, every year the prices go up. So April 2021, the, the portion of carbon tax on natural gas actually increased and it's set to go up again next year as well by about two cents. Um, and in December, the Liberal Government of Canada kind of signaled their intentions to strengthen that carbon plan and put a higher price on pollution to drive decision making in, in a low carbon direction. Um, so what we're, you know, it's not firmly placed in legislation yet, but, you know, the intention is that it's going to increase over time. Um, but, you know, why would you want to consider a water heat pump? Maybe natural gas prices are a little bit inexpensive now. Um, just to put it in perspective, for a condo building, uh, we took a look at two condo towers as part of the same building for 2020 and found that basically pre-tax, 20% of what they paid went towards the federal carbon charge. 
So there's a lot of reasons to look at this now and say, well, you know, why, why don't owners put that back in their pocket and invest in their technologies that are carbon free so that they don't have to pay this carbon tax long term. Um, even if you look at a new build project, if you're a consultant and you're designing a new project today, chances are it's not even going to go into operation for another two or three years from now. So it makes a lot of sense to look at the future energy costs of what you're projecting. But not only that, there's a lot of good reasons why you should maybe consider a dual fuel system while we're in this critical decade right now. Um, you know, if you just do business as usual and put in a chiller boiler for your next project, um, you know, post 2030, something's going to be legislated to mandate carbon reductions for your building. Um, if you just do a chiller boiler system, you'll have a power issue where, you know, maybe you didn't build up electrical capacity into the building and now you need a power fee to run some sort of electric solution. Because remember, if, we're, if the objective is to reduce the use of, of natural gas as a fossil fuel, the only way we can do it is with an electric boiler or an air to water heat pump. Um, so certainly an air to water heat pump will always be more efficient than an electric boiler because of the COP, which we'll talk about in a couple slides from now. Um, and that also means that you can decrease the sizing that's actually required for that electric boiler, depending on the system. So maybe natural gas is still going to be used in that building, but maybe you're only going to use it for that few hours of the year. And really the main objective is through energy modeling and it's reducing the greenhouse gas emission intensity of the building. Um, but you know, if we look specifically at air to water heat pumps over natural gas, if we look at the Ontario power grid, um, electricity is five times cleaner than natural gas. So this isn't even taking into account the COP from the heat pump because the COP will be instantaneous based off how the heat pump is operating at any given moment in time. But again, with a dual fuel system, you might have, you know, you could have uh, natural gas and electric heat pump in that same system. And maybe you want to operate off cheapest operating costs, or perhaps you want to operate off lowest carbon footprint. But at least by sizing and accounting for electric heat pumps today, uh, and including those in your designs, you can you have the flexibility for owners as well. So as we see price transitions over time, you have flexibility to run off natural gas or off heat pump. And certainly uh, in Ontario, as an example, where we have time of use pricing, use the heat pump when electricity is as low as cost if you're if you're going for operating costs. So again, I keep saying, you know, a holistic approach, but that's the name of the game these days is, um, you know, we're not just looking for a one size fits all solution because we're trying to manage carbon. Um, you know, if we look at building codes and, you know, for new construction, we know how to build new buildings now. Um, you know, there's been great strides in setting limitations in Canada as well on their way to achieving net zero carbon for new construction by 2030 for our buildings. Um, and for existing buildings, we're going to have to get our existing building stock cleaned up. But, you know, the general numbers that are always thrown around throughout the industry is that, you know, 40% of the energy that we use is used to heat and cool our buildings. And from that 40% of all the energy that we're using, about 80% of those buildings are existing buildings. So at some point in time, retrofits will start um, to be more of a driving factor in the market. Uh, with air to water heat pumps being you know just one piece of the puzzle obviously building envelope upgrades is kind of the it's expensive but it's also you know reducing the need to heat anyway because you're reducing your heat losses and then within that now instead of using natural gas use uh, what's called fuel switching so use air to water heat pumps but certainly if you design a building with air to water heat pump on the roof as the technology continues to improve and get better and perform better over time your building infrastructure is already set up. Your indoor coils and heat emitters are already sized to work with a lower water temperature with air to water heat pumps. So as the technology continues to get better and better, you just basically replace the unit on the roof with, with something that's even better for the next generation of it. Um, you know, and I bring this up as well because in the city of Vancouver, like Vancouver is a heat pump market, but um, you know, starting January 1st, 2022, which is, you know, uh, six, seven months away now, um, low-rise buildings, three stories and under, aren't even allowed to have natural gas in the buildings for space heating or domestic hot water. Um, so obviously they have more of a favorable climate to support heat pumps, both on the operation side and on the economic side, because they have very, very clean power. Um, but you know, this, this just shows the direction that everything's going. And I, I really think that Vancouver will be a case study um, that other jurisdictions throughout Canada will soon try to follow towards 2030. Um, so 
there's a lot of movement happening on the regulatory side and obviously with the carbon tax pricing that's going to further sway things towards heat pump technologies as alternatives <clears throat> so um so how do we compare a natural gas boiler to an electric heat pump so before we even talk about natural gas boiler let's talk about electric boiler so an electric boiler will always have a cop of one so that means for one kilowatt that you put into the heat to the electric boiler you get one kilowatt of heat out from it into the water natural gas boilers the efficiency and you know condensing gas boilers will typically operate um, you know upwards of 95 percent efficient really dependent on the return water temperature to the system but the efficiency of a boiler is really the ratio between the heating output of the BTUs that you're moving to the water divided by what was the fuel content of that gas. So we'll have typically 95% efficient boilers these days. In terms of a heat pump, how do we compare a heat pump to that? So I've mentioned this a couple of times and we'll graphically take a look at this on the next slide, but if we have a COP, which is the coefficient of performance, this is basically the heating capacity delivered to the stream of water in the building divided by the power input. So the power input in this case is what electricity are you using to run that compressor to move it. So generally with heat pumps, the COP are typically in the ranges of two to four. So for a COP nominally of three, this means for one unit of energy that you put into the machine, you get three units of thermal energy out. Um, so again, the COP is going to be influenced by outside air temperature like we talked about before. So obviously when it's very, very, very cold outside, your supply temp, um, sorry, your COP might be around two. Um, but whenever it's very warm outside, you'll have a COP of four. So again, it's about looking at how the heat pump behaves throughout the entire year and taking the averages from it. So how do we compare one thermal kilowatt hour that's provided from either a natural gas boiler or an electric heat pump. So if we look at this equation here, if we look on the left side, if we wanna know how much money we're paying for one thermal kilowatt hour from a heat pump, we will basically take a look at our dollars per kilowatt hour of electricity that we're using, and we'll divide it by the COP, because we know for one unit of power that we buy from the utility company, because of the COP, we'll get two, three, or four units of energy out. So the actual kilowatt hour that you're getting out from the heat pump is basically the dollars per kilowatt hour divided by the COP. It's a similar calculation for the boiler. So basically what's the dollars per kilowatt hour thermal that we're getting from the boiler? We divide it by the boiler efficiency to figure out how much natural gas we had to supply to that. So by equating these two equations together and rearranging them, we can basically calculate a break-even COP. But what's interesting about this is that for the break-even COP, we're expressing this not with specific costs because those will vary. Uh, we're actually comparing it based off the ratio of price cost between a kilowatt hour electricity and a kilowatt hour of natural gas. So basically by rearranging this equation, we can come up with an equation for the break even COP. And keep in mind the COP is instantaneous. So it will fluctuate over time depending on outside air temperature, building load, uh, the supply temperature that you're using from the heat pump and so on. So when we plot these equations for various boiler efficiencies, um, so here we have 95, 90, 85, and 80%, just as an example to visualize it. Um, so what we also need to do is calculate our break-even COP based off energy costs. So what I did in this case was we looked at 20 of 21 prices and really the intention of, of presenting this today, um, you know, based off the research I've done on carbon tax, I believe that natural gas prices will double um, by 2030. Um, but you can check your own utility rates. Just the only thing I would caution is, you know, if you look on your Enbridge bill for natural gas or whoever you, your, your utility provider is, on the bill, they'll kind of show, yeah, your total effective rate for natural gas is, you know, 9.8 cents per cubic meter. Uh, what I'd encourage everyone to do, you know, if, if you have access to this type of information for commercial type buildings, Take a look at the bill and just look at the total pre-tax amount and look at the total amount of natural gas that you're using and figure out what your average price is because I've done this for a number of buildings and typically 
you'll find that that true cost, including all the delivery charges and everything like that, is you know closer to 25 to 30 cents per cubic meter. Um, but obviously, figuring out specific utility costs is kind of difficult. And same with electricity. Like in Ontario, we have tiered pricing. So there's instances where the price is 17 cents per kilowatt hour or as low as 8 cents per kilowatt hour. So this is an average price just from the commercial world. Um, you know, 11, 12 cents is kind of the average number that we're told from consultants for values that they use in their calculations. So again, I'd encourage everyone to kind of just double check you know, based off your local markets, what the prices are and, and spend a bit of time going through the bills because, you know, also another perception is that natural gas is much more, uh, much less expensive to heat than electricity. But whenever you go through this exercise, you might be surprised at what you'll find. So, um, you know, all these values and some examples I have coming off are based off these costs. But again, um, this is just a starting point, so I encourage everyone to kind of do the exercise and figure out what your true costs are for your markets and your utility providers. So basically, based off 30 cents per cubic meter and 12 cents per kilowatt hour of uh, gas, we basically can figure out a cost ratio. Um, so for Ontario for 2021, uh, we believe it to be around 3.3. So just graphically, if we're going to compare this to um, a 95% efficient boiler, Really, because we're plotting this equation, we just want to figure out what boiler efficiency we're looking at. And basically, for a fixed price on this y axis, we draw a line over, we see where we hit that line, and then we look down and we say, okay, well, we need a COP that's around 3.15 in order to be cost neutral. That's to compare it to a 95% efficient boiler. If we want to look at an 80% efficient boiler, we would look at the curve for 80% boiler and look down and say, well, if we're comparing a heat pump to an 80% boiler as part of a retrofit project, then really to be cost neutral from where we started, we only need a COP of about 2.6. So again, this is how you would plot the equations and kind of calculate that based off your actual energy metrics. So I talk a lot about COP. Um, graphically, here's how we look at the COP. Um, so on the left axis here, this is showing bin hours. Um, so similar to the bin hour charts that I showed before for various climates in Canada, this is what we're looking at. Now, what you can do is look at your break-even COP that I presented on the previous slide of about 3.3. So if you draw a heat pump curve and draw the break-even COP, what you'll basically find is where these two curves intersect, that's where your economic payback point is. So graphically, if we know our break-even COP is 3.3, from the heat pump because of the efficiency curve. Again, look at the actual conditions that you're sizing it for to get the accurate COP curve from the manufacturer. But basically, if the COP curve from the heat pump is above the break-even COP line, this means that it's operational savings. Um, and certainly, whenever we're to the left of that break-even point, uh, if we are operating off heat pump, which we still can do, it's just maybe not as efficient as we would like, um, but you can still operate off the heat pump and have a lower carbon footprint. Um, but again, depending on the number of hours within the ranges, this will really be an indicator of what the actual payback is. Um, so I talked about this before for natural gas, but you know, 2021, we're here with you know, $40 per ton CO2. Um, so now if you look at that Enbridge bill I was talking about a couple slides ago where they say the total effective rate is whatever, 9.8 cents or whatever. In 2022, that's going to go up to 9.79. So the carbon tax is actually going to surpass what the um, blended rate that the utility is providing you. But what's going to happen from 2023 to 2030? I believe that the net effect will be that it'll double the price of natural gas by 2030. I don't really want to speculate. It still needs to be approved into legislation. But the intention is there that there will be some sort of price paid on pollution and that will trickle down to operating costs and buildings. Um, so I did want to provide just kind of a basic example. It's really difficult to have a simple example to quantify the savings. And this is really why we do energy modeling. Um, so if we look at air to water heat pump versus a conventional boiler, for this example, this is based off projected prices for 2025 using about 45 cents per cubic meter. Uh, with a 45 degree Celsius supply, we're only looking at using the heat pump from minus 10 C to plus 10 C with a 100 kilowatt continuous load for Toronto weather profile in a two pipe changeover system. 
So basically we're only analyzing this sec section here. If you have a two pipe changeover system, you're probably operating it in warmer days as well, taking advantage of higher efficiencies. In commercial buildings for two pipe changeover systems though, we typically don't change over on a temperature, we change over on a date. Um, so for condo buildings, as an example, it's usually middle of April or early May that they'll switch the plant into cooling and usually beginning of October, we'll switch it back into heating for the winter. So in this example, <clears throat> just looked at, you know, and this was an example saying, okay, well, if, if there's a design consultant that's going to use a chiller boiler, what we would like them to take a look at is, well, use an air to water heat pump and a conventional backup boiler as part of that. So basically, whenever you compare the two together, um, because Ontario has very clean electricity, you basically have a net result of 19% less energy consumption on an annual basis. So just looking at raw energy. And basically from a carbon point of view, we're using 82% less greenhouse gas emissions because again, in Ontario, just with electricity versus natural gas, it's five times cleaner. Whenever you also factor in the COP as a function of outside air temperature, um, that also you know, um, results in less greenhouse gas emissions as well. So we can achieve a substantial portion of our greenhouse gas emission reductions by looking at air to water heat pumps, even within the limitations of the technology itself. Still, when you operate within those limitations, the, the carbon savings and the operating costs, depending on what you're using for cost, can still be quite substantial. So I guess, you know, one of the other main takeaways from this presentation is, you know, the next time um, you're looking at air to water heat pumps or, you know, you're, if you're a consultant and your clients are asking you about air to water heat pumps, don't necessarily discount it right away. Um, you know, this is why it's called an applied product. We need to be careful about how it's adapted into the building system. But whenever it's done properly, you can realize a lot of good savings, both from a carbon and operational point of view. Um, so I was mentioning before that, you know, the heat pump COP is going to be influenced by a lot of factors. Um, and at the start of the presentation, I started off by saying design with the lowest water temperature that's feasible. This is because for, if you're comparing a 45 degree Celsius supply temperature to 40 or 35, the lower supply temperature you're using, the more efficient the unit will be. So this is looking at COP on the right axis here. So if we look at this point here, uh, let's look at zero degrees. If we have a 45 degree Celsius supply, our COP is going to be about three. If we're using a 40 degree uh, leaving water temperature from the plant, our COP is about 3.25. And if we use a 35 degree Celsius uh, supply temperature in that system, we'll have a COP closer to three and a half. So that's a substantial increase in terms of percent by using a lower water temperature. So again, if you're looking at air to water heat pumps designed for the lowest water temperature feasible. Um, in boilers, we do outdoor reset. You can do the same thing with heat pumps. So for example, if you're gonna operate off a 45 degree Celsius supply temperature, um, you know, as it gets warmer outside, you have less heat losses from the building. So you can actually increase comfort indoors by reducing the supply temperature, uh, prevent short cycling of uh, heat emitters within the building. And by using a lower water temperature with a, you know, an offset curve, similar to what we do with uh, outdoor reset, perhaps, we can also increase the COP from the heat pump. So this is just showing the difference between a variable uh, set point and a fixed set point. Um, apologize, I'm just going a couple minutes over, but we'll be sure to keep some time for questions. Uh, just a couple more minutes to finish this last section. Uh, what I wanted to do is just talk about you know, now that we've covered the fundamentals in terms of how to look at this as a box that's comparable to a boiler, but what are the limitations in applying that to the building? Um, so, you know, we've covered the operating envelope, we've covered the COP and the operating costs. So now I just wanted to kind of provide an update on the heat pump technologies that are out there um, to think about. So, um, you know, there's residential and commercial. So regarding commercial, again, I keep saying this, it's an applied product. So this means we really wanna have a holistic approach and look at how this fits into the building uh, versus doing it the other way around. Um, so we wanna figure out how that best fits into the building. Same on the residential side, but they're kind of two totally different beasts. On the residential systems, houses are a bit more simpler from a design point of view. 
um, and residential heat pump systems are basically package systems. They're monoblocks, so they'll sit outside. They'll have water connections between outside and inside. Um, but basically, these are more of a total system approach. So basically, it'll have, you know, it's a reversible heat pump, so it can do heating, it can do cooling. Um, these also typically have improved performance envelopes because they're a bit smaller and simpler products. So that means that with an improved operating range, um, this class of heat pumps can usually get 60 degrees Celsius or even sometimes 65 degrees Celsius, which is in the realm for domestic hot water. Um, so basically these heat pumps can operate, you know, in winter, they can provide heating for the uh, space heating. And whenever the buffer tank temperature is satisfied, it can switch the three-way valve and it can start making domestic hot water using an indirect tank. Uh, you can assign priorities within it. So if you know three, four people are getting up in the morning having a shower, they will eventually learn that and will produce hot water and switch between the two. Same in summertime. Um, if you do have fan coil units and cooling um, in a residential setting, you can basically have the heat pump operate to satisfy the chilled water buffer tank temperature. And then whenever that's satisfied, it can switch over and also make domestic hot water. So again, these are more of a package system approach that will do space heating, space cooling, and domestic hot water. Um, you know, there's more and more manufacturers coming to the market every year. Um, so these are great alternatives to traditional gas boilers. So usually this class of equipment will have outside air cutout temperatures of minus 20, maybe minus 25. So, um, you know, depending on the project location, you most likely still need an auxiliary heat source anyway. But again, when we look at the weather, we use that for a very small portion of the time. On the commercial side, this is where it gets a bit more interesting. There's a lot of different flavors of heat pumps. So this is specific to air-cooled heat pumps. Um, so within air to water heat pumps, there's kind of three different types. There's two pipe systems. Um, which is kind of the majority of what I talked about before. And there's also four pipe systems that do integrated heat recovery and simultaneous heat and cooling. And there's also six pipe heat pumps, which is basically a four pipe with another heat pump inside the heat pump um, that can basically boost up some of the hot water to make domestic hot water. So again, two pipe changeover, this is what we kind of talked about with some previous examples of you know, having heat pumps staged in the cooling in the summer. Uh, in winter time, you can operate those heat pumps and heating, and you have the auxiliary boiler here to operate if you're not getting the COP that you want from the heat pumps, if it's too cold to run the heat pumps, you have the flexibility in the system with a dual fuel system. And just looking at where, you know, applications where a two pipe changeover system makes a lot of sense in terms of a heat pump. Um, this is an example of a project that I was working on where, you know, we had a design consultant approach us. There were looking for an alternative to an 80 ton uh, air cooled chiller. And we said, well, instead of that air cooled chiller, use two 40 ton reversible heat pump units, size them for cooling. And basically the main benefit was that nominally the units had 152 kilowatts each. Based off the conditions that they wanted to use it, they wanted a 50 degree Celsius supply. Um, so we were able to rate the units that can continuously provide that down to minus five and still provide 107.5 kilowatts each for a total of 215 kilowatts provided from the heat pumps. And the initial boiler sizing that they had was just two 140 kilowatts, so that's 280 kilowatts total. So by just running the heat pumps down to minus five, we're still able to meet 75% of the peak heating load down to minus five, uh, which they probably wouldn't have even had a 75% load at minus five. But in this application, it made a lot of sense because um, because of the, the system set up, it was a very easy implementation from that point of view. Um, I just have this slide here. I'm gonna wrap up in a couple of minutes and we'll have time for questions, but uh, another really good application to think about air to water heat pumps is on water loop heat pump systems. So these are common in condo towers and office towers sometimes where we'll actually have terminal units that are water to air heat pumps. And we'll basically have a heat emitter and a heat rejector as part of that system. So if it's cooling dominant, we're gonna be rejecting heat. And if it's heating dominant in here, we're gonna be adding heat with the boiler. So if the objective is low carbon, um, you know, we can replace that boiler with air to water heat pumps. And this allows us to use the heat pumps all the time down to minus 15. Um, and you know, if typically condenser loop applications are sized for about 30 to 35 degrees supply temperature from the central plant, 
even though as it gets warmer outside, we could provide a hotter supply temperature, we can maintain the efficiency from the air to water heat pump at the most efficient point by continuing to provide a low set point temperature throughout the entire year in this type of system. Uh, so, you know, think about think outside the box a little bit um, in terms of how to best implement the heat pump around the project, depending on what you're looking at using for heat emitters, whether it's water loop heat pumps, uh, fan coil units, import radiant systems, and then in terms of medium temperature zones, you know, there's, uh, you're a bit limited from the supply temperature. I'm just going to skip over these since we're running out of time. Um, but basically, in two pipe heat pump systems, uh, you can also get a desuperheater within there. So, we're basically going to recover whenever the unit's operating in cooling mode. Normally, we're rejecting heat from the condenser. So, we can recover some of that heat through a desuperheater, is what it's referred to. Um, but basically, it's dependent on the compressor discharge temperature. But we basically have an additional heat exchanger in between the compressor on the refrigerant circuit and the condenser coil. So that basically whenever our recovery or storage set point on the heat recovery circuit, whenever the compressor discharge temperature is higher than that value, they typically provide a control output to open a valve or turn on a pump to then recover heat from it. But you know, nominally we can get 20 to 30% of a unit's cooling capacity recovered to the heating circuit, but that was largely going to be dependent on the compressor operating temperature. Um, but still, in cooling applications, whenever you don't need hot water and you're operating, providing chilled water to the building, you can still implement the desuperheater to do things like domestic hot water. Uh, so shown here is an indirect tank where we're maintaining a tank at a colder temperature and having our domestic cold water going through there get heated up. Basically, what this is doing is it's cutting the work of the boiler down and using less natural gas. Uh, similarly, if we're having a four-pipe system that the boilers are operating in the wintertime, while the heat pump's operating in cooling mode, maybe some of that return, maybe we want to flow it through that desuperheater based off the return temperature and the compressor loading on the cooling side and get that free energy back before we use the boiler. Still, in this scenario, we're cutting down on the amount of natural gas that the boiler is consuming. Um, so on to four pipe technologies. This is, I have two more slides three more slides. Um, basically, four pipe heat pumps are good, but before you even consider four pipe heat pumps, because those have uh, typically higher initial costs, heat recovery is good and every, it's almost become a buzzword these days. And just the only point I really have on this is heat recovery is good, but it's only good if you actually have a place to use it. So really depending on the load profile, you may just want to use a heat recovery chiller instead of a true four pipe unit, depending on what the load is. So again, this is why we do energy modeling to figure out what the best overall solution is. Um, specifically for four pipe simultaneous heating and cooling heat pumps, basically these have two refrigerant circuits within the machine. So this means that one of them can be in heating and one of them can be in cooling at the same time. But the added flavor on top of this that makes it so great is if you do have loads to justify our heat recovery throughout the year, through the refrigerant circuit, you can basically have both of them, both the compressors working in heating mode or both the compressors working in cooling mode, uh, for lack of a better word to describe it. But basically those coils that we saw in the machine in a four pipe type heat pump, these are auxiliary heat exchangers. So they can be evaporators or condensers, depending on is it heating dominated or is it cooling dominated. So in order to describe the efficiency for a four pipe heat pump, we have what's called the total efficiency ratio. So this is actually the cooling capacity plus the heating capacity divided by the power input. So typically, you know, we talked about COP from the heat pump and heating, and this would operate anywhere from two to four. But whenever you consider that you're recovering heat without really needing to do more work for your condenser fans, basically your total efficiency ratio will be at its highest value when the heating and cooling is recovered. So basically, whenever you're recovering 100% of the hot water um, through that machine. So, but still, these are, they use them a lot in British Columbia because they have a longer shoulder season. Um, but basically, it can provide heating at small levels or at high levels, and it can provide cooling at low capacities or high capacities, but it'll have its best efficiency whenever your loads are matched. So here we see it in this period here, you know, in the shoulder seasons, again, where they're getting total efficiency ratios of eight. 
Um, just last slide on this is for six pipe systems, which I referred to. This is basically a four pipe heat pump, but inside uh, what manufacturers will provide, it's basically a cascade system. So there's another compressor that will take some of the hot water that's being produced from the machine and actually use that in the evaporator of this water to water heat pump inside the air to water heat pump to basically produce domestic hot water. So these are very popular in Europe um, and there's manufacturers in Canada that offer them. Um, but basically it's the four pipe heat pump so that you can provide simultaneous heating and cooling to four pipe fan coil units for dehumidification. Plus you can also boost up some of the temperature uh, to produce domestic hot water for the building. So these are good for hotels, schools, and really for four pipe heat pumps, the best bang for your buck is applications where you have a lot of heating and cooling happening simultaneously throughout the year. So I apologize for taking a couple extra minutes, but uh, I will get some questions in certainly. And uh, for any questions that I'm not able to answer today, I'll work with, um, with Doug at HPAC to make sure that we can address all the questions that you may have. But again, just to summarize, you know, air to water heat pumps, it is new, it is different, but in a low carbon environment, we have to start to be a little bit more creative about how we're going to heat and cool our buildings. Uh, and one of the avenues for Canada to achieve our emission reduction targets will be air to water heat pumps in some forms, uh, heat pumps more generally. But you know, really the main takeaway is design for the lowest water temperature that's possible. Um, don't really worry so much about the cutout temperature from the heat pump. You know, most of the time you're probably not going to use it below minus 10 anyway. It's really about using energy in the best and smartest way that you can. But the better you can apply the technology, the higher savings and the more greenhouse gas emissions you'll be able to produce. Uh, so again, thank you everyone for taking the time to join with us today. Um, I just have my contact details here. So if you uh, have any questions about heat pumps or if you have a project, either residential or commercial that you're looking at, uh, please give me a shout. I'd be very happy to talk about heat pumps. Um, and uh, yeah, I apologize for going over a couple minutes, but we can take some questions. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Chris, if you want to leave that last slide up, um, just oh, so yeah. people can uh, see your contact information if they do have something, want to reach out to you uh, personally. Um, we, we do have about a dozen questions that came in. Um, let me just uh, run a couple of them by you right now. Uh, Leo had asked, um, and now I'm not sure, you know, hopefully you'll, you'll understand this, does windshield affect the overall heat pump objective of this type of system? Windshield, I don't know if he's referring to wind. Yeah, that, that's something that's popular on the VRF side where, you know, and, and, and that's a little bit of a different beast because the VRF systems are designed to work at very cold outside air temperatures. So I believe, you know, below minus three, 30 where you have a reduction in, in heat. So for those types of systems, because they're operating at lower temperatures, um, you would want to make sure that for those types of systems, they implement wind guards so that whenever you have blowing winds going into that evaporator, that it's not, it's almost like a wind chill people think, think of it as. Um, in terms of the refrigerant itself, it's extracting heat from the environment. So yeah, conditions will affect it. So like snow or rain blowing on the unit will affect it. Um, but certainly you can design around that by locating the machine with you know proper guards on the roof or whatever and typically from an architectural point of view typically at our buildings we have mechanical penthouses covering everything so even for those high buildings they're going to usually put up retaining walls or or something like that to, to guard from the wind a little bit so it, it's it's good to account for it but it's not the end of the world if if, if it's not included okay okay um charlie asks would boilers be designed for the full heating load or will the heat pump system always provide some heat? So the heat pump systems will typically have a fixed hard cutout at minus 15. So if it's minus 15.1 degrees, the heat pump shuts off. Um, and again, you have to consider what that limitation is versus your design temperature, because if the heat pump shuts off at minus 15, but your design temperature is minus 25, you're sizing that boiler to be the sole source of heat down to minus 25 anyway. Yeah. Um, However, that said, you can look strategically at how the heat pump will operate with a boiler. You can operate them in parallel, but the challenge with that is that the heat pump is influenced by outside air temperature where the boiler isn't. So technically, even though the heat pump can still work, but maybe its supply temperature is decreasing, 
now you have more of a control thing and it is going to be based off the return temperature because um because basically you want both of those heat sources to have the same supply temperature and maybe if the boiler is still providing 60 degrees as an example but now the heat pump can only or sorry 55 degrees we'll say and then 50 degrees maybe the heat pump can supply a lower temperature and then maybe you can up the temperature on the boiler so that your leaving mix temperature is still at your set point that you want. So you can operate them together. You just need to keep in mind that your supply temperature will change according to outside air and you need to control that in some way. Yeah, okay. Uh, one person asked, he'd like to understand how this is possible in existing buildings with, uh, with a hydronic system. And if you have examples of retrofitted buildings with air to water heat pumps using a boiler as an auxiliary system, where it was originally designed for boiler chiller. Um, yeah, and, and those projects are challenging. And there's no right or wrong answer. There's really wrong answers, and but it's all subjective to it. I do have some, if you want to send me an email, whoever that is, uh, I do have some examples, um, you know, similar to the six pipe that I showed at the end, you can get large commercial water to water units. So maybe that's one solution because if you have a building existing, how will those coils and heat emitters in the building behave with a lower water temperature? And usually that's something that no engineer, like in a retrofit situation, you don't wanna look at, like I was involved in this with the project that we were looking at last week. Um, it's a 30 year old building that had fan coil units designed for 180 F water temperature. And now you're talking about using a heat pump to supply heat to those coils and no engineer will really want to take a risk and say yeah it'll be fine right so usually part of that project involves changing out all the fan coil units so if you're talking in toronto for a condo building project that's you know changing out four or five hundred fan coil units it's, it's a large undertaking there's ways around it though where you can actually use a water to water heat pump fed by the air to water heat pump um, and boost up that temperature and still get decent COPs. So um, if you want to reach out, I have some information on that that I'd be happy to share with you and go over. Okay, awesome. Um, Bogdan asked, how long is the defrost cycle? I assume that's variable or? It varies depending on the conditions, but typically they're, you know, anywhere between three and six minutes, typically. Like modern technologies, the defrost itself is optimized because it's a heat pump it's not a defroster, it needs to make hot water throughout the winter. So they've optimized them so that based off the actual conditions, it's minimizing the defrost time generally from, from all manufacturers that have this equipment available. Um, so it's not as bad as you'd think. And the other important part to keep in mind is that with these types of systems, you're gonna have a buffer tank in the building. So you're basically, it's basically a big battery of hot water that you're maintaining for the building. So even though you're doing defrost, you still have a huge buffer tank where you know, building loads can pull from that. So it's really not necessarily um, that detrimental is what you would think. Uh, someone's asking uh, about the refrigerants uh, being used and if, there, if there's any uh, danger of refrigerants getting phased out, which refrigerant mm -hmm. should be specified these days. I mean, I assume that's all built into the, the machine, so. Yeah, um, so this, from, from many manufacturers that have this available, typically everyone's using R410A. The challenge with refrigerants is CSA B52 and all the refrigerant standards, yes, we are phasing out 410A to have low GWP refrigerants. Um, the problem right now in Canada is the safety codes aren't really updated to mandate that into the building. But for air to water heat pump, keep in mind that it's a monoblock, so all the refrigerants can contained outside. Um, so, it's not re really a safety issue in terms of what you might be thinking of on the VRF side with refrigerant in the building because all the refrigerants actually contained outside. That said, next generation refrigerants, like from Clima Veneta in, in Europe, they already have the next generation of refrigerants in all of their products already defined um, and designed for the next generation of refrigerants. I would love to bring those products into North America right now, but the safety codes just aren't there at this time. Um, however, they are looking at you know R32 or R454B for this type of equipment as a drop-in replacement. Only question would be you know are the compressors compatible with it? And that's a good question. Yeah, awesome. Um, someone's asking: Are the residential monoblock units available for single phase uh, 240V? Um, not officially available, but. Um, Mitsubishi, we are 
you know, looking at introducing that because it is a growing market that we want to get into. So uh, they're not available at this time, but we're hoping to introduce them next year, uh, potentially some some pilots as well. So um, feel free to email me if you have a suitable pilot project. Um, we can definitely talk next steps. Okay. Chris, just to let you know, your video did freeze, but it's still yeah. working. The audio is great. Um, here's another question for you. Do we need to be concerned about hot boiler water coming back to the heat pump? Do we need heat pump return protection? Maybe a sensor that turns off the heat pump if the water coming back is either too hot or too cold? Yeah, that's... Yeah, I, have a, I didn't go over this today, but uh, I have some information on that. And yeah, basically the return temp, like people think, okay, well, the heat pump can only give me up to 55, but I want 60. So I'm going to boost it up with a boiler to get it up to 60. But it's important to remember that your design supply and return temperatures, you'll only see your design supply and your design return at your design date conditions at the coldest outside air temperature. So yeah, eventually if you look on, um, the operating envelope, if you were to draw a line for the return, you'd see that eventually at like minus five, the return temperature actually comes back above what your maximum leaving water temperature is. So yeah, in, in those instances, the heat pump would shut off. And that's why even for parallel applications, if you're using them both at the same time, um, again, depending on the return temperature, the heat pump might not be able to work. Um, so again, application is key. So you want to look closely at those things. Okay. Um, what is the approach for buffer tank sizing? Is there a rule of thumb? Um, so it's specific to the manufacturer. So whenever you size a heat pump from the manufacturer, usually the manufacturer will specify for that specific model what the minimum buffer tank size is to prevent short cycling of the compressors. Um, so be sure to ask for that information if you're if you're getting a, a unit selected for you. But we we provide that Mitsubishi provides that whenever we make uh, selections for you. Okay. Now, a couple people have asked about the presentation, if it's available. Um, and just to let everyone know, uh, this session is being recorded, and it will be sent to everyone who did register. Um, is, is the presentation available, Chris? I don't know people, if they reached out to you, or we could send it if you... Um, yeah, we can send it. Yeah, I'll work with HPAC, and we'll send out a copy of it. We did, like, we did a similar webinar as well with HRAI a couple weeks ago, and yeah, we'll send out copies of the PDF slides for everyone to view. And, and of course, if you have any questions or want to discuss anything, we can definitely go over it. Okay, that's great. And people are asking how to get in touch and that's why we've left this screen up. So hopefully people are taking advantage of that. Um, someone did ask, how are your products available to us? Um, are the commercial products, is that a direct? How does that one? Um, so yeah, so Mitsubishi, we have our distributors throughout Canada. Um, in Ontario, we are selling direct to contractors as well, except for Ottawa. Um, but yeah, if you have any sales, um, uh, our website, I'm still working on the website of getting uh, where to buy type thing set up. But yeah, if, if you're interested in it, just you have my contact information, shoot me a note and uh, I can put you in touch with the right people. Um, but again, in the British Columbia market, we have a direct office and same for Ontario everywhere except Ottawa, we're selling direct. Okay. Okay, Chris, um, I think that's about our time. I think we've run a, about uh, not quite 15 minutes over. So I hope everyone uh, who stayed has had their uh, questions answered. Again, if you have more, Chris's information is below, or you could email me and we can certainly get information to Chris and get answers back to you. Like I said, the uh, session is being recorded, so it will be available for review. Once again, I'd like to thank Chris for your time today and this presentation. Uh, extremely uh, informative and tons of data, which I think that's why people want to yeah. take a look at this stuff again, because it's all pretty valuable information. So thank you. Yeah, yeah it's a lot to squeeze into an hour, but I hope everyone found it interesting and informative. You have my information on how to connect, so please reach out and be happy to, to discuss with you. Awesome. Thank you again, and thank you to... Uh, Klima Venita and Mitsubishi Electric Sales Canada for presenting this webinar. And that's it. Thanks again, Chris. All right. Thanks, Doug.